In this video, we'll take the SVG file spectrum that we created in Cy Davis and edit it and annotate it in the drawing package Inkscape. Okay, in the first video I showed you how to make the spectra in Cy Davis and then export the spectrum as an SVG file. In this second uh, video we're going to load that SVG file into Inkscape, edit it and annotate it and then we can try saving it in different vector file formats. So let's begin. Uh, I've opened up Inkscape uh, as you can see here. So if we go to the file menu and import, we can find that file that we saved from Cy Davis. And there that is. And the other thing I'm going to load up here just to make it easier is the sort of style file, the kind of image we're trying to make with this. So if I go file import, this is actually a PNG file, so this one is a, a bitmap graphic. Uh, we can put there to see the sort of uh, thing we're trying to make. Okay, and in the background you can see the size of an A4 page. That doesn't actually matter, and um, we're going to change the document size later, but it's just there to help you with scale. So the first thing we'll do, if you click and drag over both of those two graphics, uh, we can look at some of the shortcuts in Inkscape. So looking at the number keys, if I click the number three now, the screen automatically resumes to fit whatever you have marked at the time. And if I hit five, it automatically zooms so that the A4 page fits on the screen exactly. So three and five are two very useful shortcuts in Inkscape. If you go up to view and zoom, you can see there's a bunch of other ones. So hitting one zooms to one to one, two zooms to one to two, three zooms to the uh, selection, four zooms to the whole drawing, five zooms to the page and six zooms to the page width. Um, but you can also zoom in and out just using plus or minus. And if you actually look down at the bottom of the screen down here, you also have a zoom tool here. So I can say set to 100, um, but I think zooming out to the bits I've marked just now are the most useful. So this figure over here uh, is the one we just made inside Avis. This one here is the one I made earlier just to give us a style guide to go for. So you can see the two aren't identical, that doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is make a nice looking figure. And so we'll put all the annotations that are in here uh, over onto this one. So this uh, figure here, you can see if I click it, everything is marked at the same time because they're grouped together. But if I double click into it, I can start isolating and marking specific parts. And the reason why that's useful is you see for some reason when Cy Davis exports stuff as SVG, you see these tags here are too close to the little tick mark that's next to them. So if you double click an image until you're marking just an individual element, then you can shift click and mark all the numbers on the y-axis and intensity and then if you use the left cursor key and click that three times you can see that the uh, writing moved a little bit to the left each time and now if I click off that you'll see it's got a much better spacing there so that's a, an annoying frustration with Cy Davis it's a, a very very good program but it does have that uh, small annoyance in it that you have to move the y-axis tabs and the same here so if I click Oops, in this one, far enough over to the right. There we are, left, sorry. And then shift click all of the other numbers, making sure I don't select little tags. And then move them over to the right again, three cursor clicks. Then those are all moved nicely. The next thing I notice is that the spectra that I do before had no borders on them, whereas this one does. And actually, I think that looks nice. So if we click on the borders you maybe double click a couple of times to make sure you're just selecting the border and once it's selected click delete and the same here and these uh, fairly simple examples are, are an important feature to notice that when you save that SVG file from Cy Davis yes you can't redraw the graph but you can edit all the individual components on the graph and that can be very useful okay so we have our uh, the main view of the graph here um, what I also notice is that I made the spectrum lines a bit thicker on this one than here and the question is are these going to be too thin uh, in a final image actually I think they are quite thin so I'll mark that box that ma mark that spectrum and then if you can't see the fill and stroke box if you go to view is it in view hmm I'll, I'll 
object there we are in under the object one you've got fill and stroke that would make this little box appear so fill is the color that fills an area stroke is the color of the lines that an area is made of and the stroke style lets us look at how that line is so in this case it's only uh, 0.265 millimeters wide it's actually I find it more useful to look in points so that's 0.751 if I make that one point thick line or a 1.5 point thick line yeah that'll do and that will just make sure that when we uh, plot it at a smaller size we don't lose that line we could change other things about the line we could for example if we wished make it a dashed line I don't know if that'll show because it's uh, got so many points in there yeah you can see there's a dashed line in there now um, but for this one let's keep it as a solid line so of the annotations we want to add to this the first bit is to highlight the area that we zoomed up in the main the main spectrum so in order to draw that we want to be able to draw a rectangle so you see you've got a bunch of tools on the left here one of these is the rectangle box create rectangles and squares so we click that and then we're over here so this little bump here is this little one here and these two oops on this side are oops this one and this one so we want to draw a box that just surrounds them oops I've slightly missed it doesn't matter it'll all be editable so once I've drawn the box if I just flick up to this little arrow one I can now expand that box to the size I want and remember we can hit the three button now this box is selected because you can see those handles around it if I hit the number three we will zoom into that box specifically and now if I want I can uh, pull that up a little bit there we are and now again if I do five uh, we'll zoom out Oops. and then if you actually on the uh, number pad on the right hand side if you hit the minus key you'll zoom out and the plus key you'll zoom in so we'll just zoom out till we can see the whole image uh, so I still want to make this a little bit bigger so we can see what's inside it so there I've drawn the box uh, when you draw yours you may find that it has some sort of fill um, if the box is full then just go to the fill tab in fill and stroke and switch it to the little X so there's no paint filling that rectangle and it was originally a red box so we can set that to red if we just pull the blue back to zero and the red all the way up to 255 then you can see we've got a red box now the line is too thin so let's make that a nice thick line let's say two points is that thick enough uh, no let's make it a little bit bigger let's say three points and it's a dashed box so we'll choose one of the dashes there we go so there's our our zoom area which shows what we've zoomed up down here and if we wish to annotate that we can add text annotations using this little text tool so if I click on the thing I can now say zoom area and if I want to make that red text I can just click down here on red zoom area now that font is perhaps a little small so while I've got that marked if I then click this text one again I can go back and edit it so let's mark it and set the size so if I set it up to 24 no let's try a bit bigger 28 there we go and then I can use the little cursor buttons to move it until I think is a good area okay so we have the zoom area marked uh, the next thing we want to do is add these annotations on these monoisotopic peaks so let's start off with this one so we need to generate this tag here so again we choose the text tool just click it on the background so we're going to have m dot n a plus and we want to make the plus uh, superscript uh, so if you do shift and then the back cursor will mark it and then we can choose superscript or subscript with these options so we'll make it a superscript there we go and we probably want to make it the same size as this so that was 28 so just keep clicking in there and we'll set that to 28 approximately position it 
and it was blue so let's make it uh, blue so there we have our, our blue one I'll just zoom in because we're going to need to see lines in a minute so if we mark everything and then hit five oops um, I went three there we are to zoom to what we marked so the next thing we need to draw is the arrow that connects this label to the peak so we can draw uh, you can draw wiggly lines by using this tool uh, but they're not going to look very neat uh, better for drawing arrows is this tool underneath the Bezier tool so to draw a straight line you click where you want the line to start and then you double click where you want the line to end and that gives you a straight line uh, but in our case we want a curved line so to draw a curved line you click and then drag in one direction away from that starting point for a little bit and then let go and move the mouse to where you want the line to end and then double click to finish the line and then we want to make the line thicker so we'll make it as thick as this line was here so that was change it to points so I think that was a three point line uh, we don't want to make it dash but we do want arrows at the end of it so you see you've got these markers here this is for a mark at the beginning of the line and a marker at the end of the line so in our case we want to put a little arrowhead at the end of the line Oops, see there it is there and we also want to make this line the same color as the text now we could try to mi match the uh, RGB code here but there's a shortcut for doing it and that's to use this little eyedropper so we click that and then click on something that is the color we want that line to be there you go so in that writing and now we've got that line being the right color and then we can repeat making these logos for the other two peaks um, rather than making everything the same again if we just copy that and paste that down there and then oops, and then click on it we can edit that so that's m dot k it's a potassium adduct oops moving the wrong bit copy that again put it over here this one is actually a protonated iron but with two extra methanols attached it was a, a sample that was sprayed using a methanol solvent so it's m.2 m e o h dot h it's the iron for that one okay so that'll be the label for that one now it will look neater if we align this label with this one so if we mark this one first so if you're not clicked on it click on it to mark it so you can see the handles and then hit hold down the shift key click the other one now you can see they're both marked now if we want to align that if you go to the object menu and align and distribute then you'll get this box here giving you a number of alignment options so if we choose this option here center on the horizontal axis we'll line those two up exactly now we want to draw um, arrows for both of these. Well, that's not very good. Let's uh, zoom in and I'll show you what we can do to edit that. So in that case I drew that line not very well. But because this is a drawing package, conveniently, if I click on here, I actually have the capacity to edit all the points. On that line so if I click on by using this tool here so by clicking on the endpoints I can move the endpoints by clicking on this little handle I can change how much curve it has and so that that looks like quite a nice line now so if I go back to stroke style remember those were three point lines uh, and they had that little arrow on the end and then I want to make it the same color as the writing so I choose the little eyedropper tool and then set it out like that and we can zoom back out to see everything okay so that's that one done and then we can draw another arrow for this one so again we may have to go and edit that it snapped to 
parts of the existing diagram. So again, we mark it and then choose this edit path by node. So if I click on this one, I can change, oops. Change that line and this one ended up too close. That will do. So we're back in stroke tile, so three points and that line there. Oops, I think it's far up. Oh, that's what's wrong. Three, there we are. Notice how the line rescaled as I drew it there, the thickness of the line. So I've changed it back to being three, and then again we need to change the color. So again, choose the eyedropper tool and choose the right color. So if I mark everything, hit three, we can zoom in. Okay, so we've marked the the major peaks there. Let's go in and look at the peak differences. So the 16 Dalton and this 42 Dalton mass difference. So we can add that. So let's start off with this vertical dotted line here so again we'll choose the line tool uh, we'll click where we want the line to start and then we want to draw a, a straight line but more importantly we want this line to be exactly vertical now we can try and do that by eye by very finely controlling the mouse but there's an easier way to do it and that is if you hold down the, sh the control key you can see the line is then held to specific angles so it's very easy to put in a specifically vertical line then, and then we just double click to finish the position of that line. Now in this case, for some reason, that line has decided it already wants to be dashed. Is that real? I don't know. Let's see. Let's go down and choose a dashed line. Points will make it three points wide. Let's see what that looks like. Not really the right dashing to use. Let's choose... Well, that's looking quite good. Uh, it's maybe not positioned exactly, so we can use this magnifying glass tool and zoom in, click it, and then you can use the cursor keys to align it exactly where you want it. And then we can zoom back out to see the whole image. Okay, and then we need to add the little 16 Dalton arrow that joins that to the main peak. So if I just zoom in on that figure alone, it'll be easier to add it. So again, I choose the line tool. Uh, click where I want the line to start, hold down the control key to make it a horizontal line and then double click where I want the line to end. Again we'll make it a 3mm line and uh, this time I want arrows at the beginning and the end. And then we'll have to adjust the size of it a little. Oops. Again, let's default it annoyingly to millimeters when I want it to be points. Thought it looked a bit thick. Okay, and then we can add the label to that. Uh, so that, as I recall, was 16 Daltons. And I think we're making the font 28. So that was the first one. The second one is this 42 Dalton line. So I'll copy that and then do control C to copy and then control V to paste and I have a copy of it. So I can drag that where I want it. Uh, and I want to make it the same height as the other line. So how do I do that? Well, the easiest way to do that is to draw a horizontal line. So we'll click there, hold down control. That will give me a horizontal line and now if I zoom in so I can see the tops of both of those lines I can put that one on the top there and then take this one and stretch it up until it's in the right place and then I can delete this little guideline And then 
I want to draw an arrow from there again along here. So click where I want the arrow to start, control to keep it horizontal, and then double click where I want the arrow to end. I want that to be a three point line with arrows at the beginning and the end. And you can see all the different en other endings of lines you could have here. And then we can oops, rescale that exactly how we want it. One thing we might want to do is have these two start and end, well, start in exactly the same place. So if we click one and shift click the other and then go back to the alignment one, we can align the left edges so that they definitely start uh, in the same place. And then we want to add the label to this. Well, that the label for this longer line is going to be this basically the same as that one. So again, we'll copy, Control C, and then Control V to paste, and move that one over here. And if we just keep clicking it, eventually it'll turn back into a text box. And this would happen to be forty-two dollars. So we hit minus oops, until we can see everything, and then we can mark it and zoom to fit. Okay, so that's basically, we've basically recreated um, that figure fairly quickly and simply. It's not identical, but it holds all the information we need. Uh, and the only thing I might want to do now is I'm not convinced that that zoom area is in the right place. I think it looks better over there because it was rather congested when we had it centered. So there we have our figure. Uh, if we just delete the style guide one now, if you mark by clicking and dragging over the whole figure and then do Control G, you'll group everything so that it's now fixed as a single thing. You can ungroup again later if you want to, but it's useful to have everything uh, as a single unit. Now, if you look at the top of the screen here, having uh, marked the whole unit, we can see uh, we have some scale here or position. So this X tells us where the um, that figure starts in terms of screen coordinates and Y is in the, so X gives you in this direction, Y gives you in this direction. But importantly, we also have the width and the height currently set in millimeters. And we can change that unit to anything we want. So for example, we can change it to centimeters. And then we have control over the exact height and width that, that image has. Now in this case, if I just set this to, uh, let's set it just for sake of argument, to 10 centimeters wide, you see what it's done is it's squashed the picture up horribly. And that changing of the shape of uh, an illustration not just changing the scale, but also changing the shape or the aspect ratio, ends up with horribly squashed looking figures, which is something you want to avoid. So if we do Control Z to undo that, what we need to do in order to scale this equally in both directions is to lock this little padlock here, you see? So if we click that and lock it, now if I change that to being 10 centimeters wide, you see everything has scaled proportionately and I have a little copy of our original figure, but now 10 centimeters wide, and you can see how that would look on our um, A4 page there. So some common sizes for uh, figures in journals, 7.5 centimeter wide figures cover a single column if you have a two column page, which a lot of journals have, or 15 centimeter wide ones uh, cover two columns of a page. So we'll set this to be a, a 15 centimeter wide uh, image. Now we might want to save that, so if we go to File, Save As, we'll save this under the same name as the original SVG file, only we'll add that we've annotated it. Now although I rescaled it here to make it the size required for two columns in a journal article or for a report, what if I subsequently want to put this on a poster? Well I can rescale that up here as well. If I change that back to centimeters, what happens if I want to make a 50 centimeter wide um, figure to use on a poster? If I hit that, you see this is still completely scalable, only now it's huge compared to an A4 page, you know, suitable for size for a poster. And yet if I zoom in on it, it's still not pixelated. You see everything is still smooth and crisp on there. All the edges of the letters are the same. I know the data in here was stored at a low number of decimal places, which is why the spectrum looks a bit jagged, but that's fine for this example. So the fact that we have uh, played around with the scale, because it's a vector format image, it's still completely scalable, 
but it is useful for us to be able to set it to a particular size. So let's set it back to the 15 centimeter wide size just now. And we'll oops, zoom to the page. So that's uh, the basics of how you make a figure in Inkscape. There are, of course, a whole bunch of other things you can do. You can draw polygrams or spirals or circles. Uh, you can measure things on here. You've got the zoom tool. I showed you how to edit some things by paths. Uh, you can fill things with colors. You can spray objects or sculpt them. You can pick colors from things to use elsewhere. There's a whole variety of interesting things you can do in paths here where you can make the union or difference or intersection between things. So I would strongly recommend you doing some research online and finding out all these different things you can do in Inkscape because they really will help you produce very high quality figures, um, which from the point of view of degree will get you better marks and allow you to produce reports and presentations and posters faster. And then it's a very, very useful set of skills to have when you go into the professional world for the times when you need to make diagrams or figures or logos or maps or things uh, in your work. Okay, uh, I will end that video here and uh, we'll do a new video on exporting this figure in different file formats.